Well, welcome back to The Pew, everybody. I am your host, John Edwards, and here across the table from me, as always, is my co-host and cohort, Victor Adams. Yes, and uh, this is the last week of Lent. Yeah. Uh, we're, and, and Holy Holy Week. Yeah, right? we just entered into Holy yeah. Week, yeah. Yep, and uh, I think Friday we had a really good time. I mean, we had fish fry, I was booming, and it was yeah. good to see everyone come out and really not only just to support, but to be part of the community as we, yeah. we, we kind of walk ourselves into Holy Week. So. Yeah, I mean, we had a huge crowd. I mean, we had a bunch of work. There was a lot right, of people in there. Right. I, what was the uh, – we had another party going on, too. Yeah, right? there was yeah, some, yeah. somebody at the church had like a – Event. Some kind yeah. of bowling league. Thing. I don't know what it, what was going on, but they were part of some bowling thing, and there was like 120 plates they yeah. ordered, and then, then everybody showed up because it was the last one, right? right? So it was – and then March Madness was on in there. They had right. TV rigged and all that stuff, so – Lots of people there. It was great. You know, I only got to go to two of them because we're on the road a lot. Yeah. So, but that's why I love to be at the ones I can be, just because it's a good time getting to serve others and help and all those things. And just always a uh, one of those pillars of Lent to me. Like, yeah. it's just kind of one of the things I associate with it is putting others first in that way. So, mm-hmm. yeah, it was great. Then you and I we're, we're dressed up because we're filming this on Sunday, Palm Sunday. It'll come out on Tuesday of Holy Week, and so just had that uh, that grace to. To really, you know, Palm Sunday calls us back into yeah. Jesus riding into Jerusalem. And, you know, I, I don't know how often we sit with it, but I always think of, man, like he knew exactly what was going to happen, and he went willingly right in there mm-hmm. to it. And so many people out there feel like God doesn't love me or God can't love me or, you know, some of those things. But right. in the end, I mean, Jesus willingly chose to march right into that horrific um, painful death yep. because of his great love for us. So, you know, we've got an opportunity, as we said, we've been doing this this series. Uh, now this will be the seventh week. It's the seventh deadly sin. So we have a final week to enter into this. And that's what I would say, like, no matter what one of these sins you struggle with or you may be dealing with here, um, there's still plenty of time to, to be able to to enter into this week. So maybe you fudged, maybe you fell out a little bit in the beginning. Maybe you've had other things going on. I mean, we have too. I, I had to put my dog down today. There's been all kinds of different stuff going on with travel and Angela in school and all those things. And it's so easy to think, well, man, I didn't really, didn't really enter in as much as I'd like. Well, it's not over yet, right? You still got a week to really enter into the most important part of this Lent, which is to kind of tie yourself to the passion of our Lord and walk alongside him as he as he goes to to be the great sacrifice for all of us uh, out of his great love. So you've got that. And then, as we said before, Lent is supposed to be all of our lives, not just 40 days, right? We're supposed to live that way all the time. So we're going to enter into that next sin here in just a minute, start talking about our final sin. Shouldn't be too hard for you to figure out which one. All you got to do is subtract the six right. that we've already talked about, and you'll have an answer. But uh, before we do that, I just wanted to tell everybody that we are going to be in Columbus, Ohio on April the 13th. Uh, I was up there for the, I think it's the largest men's conference in the country. One of my favorite conferences back a few weeks ago, we were talking about Victor, um, you know, Chris Stefanik and Father Burke Masters and I, and those guys had the foresight and the willingness to listen, the humility to listen to to me about, hey, can we do more than just a conference? So we're going to have a day uh, at St. Paul the Apostle Catholic Church in Westerville, Ohio. It's a beautiful big church. We had the night before dinner there when I was there for the conference. But we're going to have a continuing the conversation event, uh, and every man in the area is, is is welcome, whether you're in Columbus or another part of Ohio. Show up and join us. It starts at 8.30 with Mass. We have several talks. It's going to be a faith and a fellowship type day. I'm also going to run through how to start and launch men's groups. So if you're a guy in that area that wants something in your parish, come and be with us. We're going to talk about the heart of a leader and the mind of a leader. We're going to talk about the the processes we use to launch these vibrant, life-changing ministry to men, uh, groups in parishes. And then we're going to have talks about just what it means to be a man and what it means to be a man of God. So come and join us. There's already, uh, they're expecting hundreds of guys to be registered and show up that day. So if you're in the Ohio area, come and be with us on April the 13th at St. Paul, the Apostle Catholic Church in Westerville, Ohio from 830 to 2 o'clock. We'd love to see you. It's a day for men. Come out, join us. And if you went to the conference, you heard me say, is this going to be it for you, or are you going to continue on? Well, this is the event to make sure you continue on. So come and join us again at St. Paul the Apostle Catholic Church in Westerville, Ohio, April the 13th. Guys in Columbus, can't wait to see you and be with you. Guys, I also want to say really quickly, and ladies, um, thank you. Uh, last week, I took a few minutes in the beginning to really talk about uh, supporting our ministry and becoming partners in the pew. And quite a few people did that. Some people did a one-time donation. We thank you for those. And some became uh, monthly partners in the pew. 
thank you because we just made a hire and it's it's uh, it's going to be a great hire, but it's one that we definitely need support to continue on with. Um, and also, there's things that we need in the ministry. And, you know, that's that's why we need the support, quite frankly. Um, it's hard to grow and to do things and to have what you need to continue to walk in the in the way that the Lord needs us to and to grow in the way that he's calling us to without that support. Um, you know, I just want to share with you again, so many men have shared their hearts about where they've been and they somehow found this podcast or they somebody invited them to a conference or they came to a mission Either way, they're a part of a men's group or they're believing they can be a leader and they're turning their lives around. I can't tell you how many men come up and they they smell of booze and they're just admitting that they're alcoholics and they're destroying their family or that they're doing drugs or that they're addicted to porn or whatever it is. And our men are just struggling so mightily and so quietly and so silently alone. And the only people that know that is their wife and the people that know them best because we're so good at putting on these masks and these facades to be everything's fine to the world, but we're these broken disasters inside. And, you know, I was reading the first reading in Palm Sunday today. It's from Isaiah 50. And obviously it's prophesying the Lord Jesus Christ in the moments that we're in as we lead to Holy Week. But it says, the Lord God has given me a well-trained tongue that I might know how to speak to the weary, a word that will rouse them. And I feel like that's what the Lord is doing in this ministry, is he's giving Victor and I and everybody else involved in this work words to rouse the weary. Um, you may be one of those weary souls, and hopefully you found help in this. But folks, for us to continue to reach those people that are weary, those people that are at their wits' end, the people that are about to walk out on their marriages, the people that their wives are about to walk on, out on them, they're struggling in worse hells than than we can even imagine. We're building places in our parishes where they can find hope, where they can find home, where they can find refuge, right? Where they can be introduced to a relationship with Jesus and with other men. And so when we ask for your support to become partners in the pew, it's not just to buy a computer. It's not just to, to do this or to do that. Yes, we have those needs in the ministry. But the greatest thing it allows us to do is to continue to help these men even more and better and more proficiently and more rapidly than we've able to, been able to do in the past. So all we want to do is be there for the men the way that God has been there for us and the way that other men in our parish and our lives have been there for us. So if you're interested in helping with that, if you've been helped at all in any way with our show, with our podcast, with the YouTube channel, with the conferences, anything we've done, please consider becoming a partner in the pew. You can do that by going to justgotinthepew.com, going to our website right there in the middle of the page. You'll see a, or up in the top right corner of the page, you'll see a support button. Click that. You can give there, or you can go straight to www.donorbox.org slash pew. That, that's our online giving. You can go there. There's also our address there. You can write a check, but we would love to have that monthly support so we can continue to see how we can see to the needs of the ministry to grow in order to keep up with the crazy demand that we have in the world to go help our men. So uh, I'll put that in the show notes too so it's easy for those of you to find if you are somebody looking to give. Again, to those who have given, thank you, thank you, thank you. And to those who will consider it, we thank you in advance as well. So Victor, we're going to go back here to really talking about the episode and and getting into what we're going to talk about today. So I alluded, we've talked to this, about the six uh, deadly sins already out of the seven. This week, we're going to talk about the mother of all of them, yeah. pride. Um, I don't think there is a single person in this world that can say that they don't struggle with pride. Right? I just don't think that there's anybody out there that's like, nope, I'm super humble all the time, right, right. 98, 99.8% of the time. Which you need to negotiate it. Which well, in wait, itself neg- would be neg- prideful. Negated, yeah, negated. <laughs> That by saying I'm by by promoting how humble you are, you're negating your your humility. Yeah, yeah, ex- right. exactly. But there's so many of us out there that think, oh no, I'm 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 good. I don't right. I don't need this. I don't need that. Right. I, I'm I, I'm 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 self sufficient, and we don't even realize sometimes how prideful we are. Right. Right. We just think that we're being uh, what I'm supposed to be. I'm supposed to be a man, and I'm yeah. supposed to see to things myself and not need anybody or anything. And great, it's great to be self sufficient. But those things can also lead us to pride. And as we've talked, you know, from the beginning here in this Litton series, we've talked about returning with our whole hearts. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, again, it's that Joel, that verse from Joel, Joel two twelve, where he says, "Render your hearts, not your garments. Return to me with your whole hearts." You know, it's it's as we start off on Ash Wednesday, and as we come into the Passion Week, hopefully, we're starting to return to God with our whole hearts. If it's just a piece at a time, yeah. it's gonna be our whole lives before we can actually give Him our whole hearts. Yeah, but. The, the, the goal is to be working on that each and every day. And let me tell you something. It's impossible to even give God more pieces of your heart if you're living in pride, mm-hmm. if you're living in this just, 
overwhelming bout with pride, right? Because it's just you start to get so self-sufficient, you start to think so highly of yourself that, you know, there's only room in your heart for 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 God or yourself, right? right. Or the devil, whichever one you're playing to. Um, and the thing is, as you're increasing in your own thoughtfulness of yourself or your self, unholy self-sufficiency, you're taking the room away that's mm-hmm. there for God. So we definitely want to jump into this. Um, you know, we've started every... Every episode talking about, you know, thanks to Dr. Bob and his work uh, and one of the workbooks I have, we've always talked about the idolatry associated with the sin. Mm -hmm. And this week, you know, obviously with pride, the idolatry is self, right? It's very inwardly focused is what pride is about. Um, Sometimes it's a mechanism to combat our inadequacy, you know, that that overabundance and that arrogance that comes with trying to hide wounds and cover up from our our deficiencies. Um, but yeah, pride's something that can wreck all of us. And there's many saints that have, have said, you know, it's the root of all sin. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, you know, we, we know examples of, of pridefulness in the scriptures. You know, we go all back to, you know, David's uh, behavior before and after Bathsheba and all that stuff, what yeah. happened there. Also, the, you know, the kingdoms of the Old Testament and, you know, the kingdom of Israel, kingdom of Judah, where they've had bad kings and good kings and kings that just really were weak kings, you know. Yeah. But mo- most of those were were motivated by prideful decisions that cost them their kingship, you know, yeah. or uh, loss of wars, loss of Israel itself. And, you know, even Nebuchadnezzar was like, you know, oh, yeah. <laughs> God granted him a whole kingdom, but then he, he started getting boastful about, I did all this, this is all mine. And then he was struck with like, you know, um, I get a psychotic breakdown. Yeah, you know? he started throwing people in the fire. Right, and all right, that yeah. Stuff. yeah. And, and he wandered for a couple of years, you know, and crawling on all fours and stuff. So, and then God restored him. But like I said, that's because we are all able to be restored from our sins. But you know, being pridefulness is the most blinding sin, I think, because yeah. we, we, we convince ourselves we can't do no wrong or that we're right in, in, in how we view things and di- are dismissive of other people. Sure. And there's, I mean, there's a difference between being proud and yeah. pride. Like, you do something, you know, that that's good or you accomplish something that's great to go, man, I really worked hard for that. And I can't believe that the Lord gave me this gift. Yeah. And, you know, it's good to be proud of yourself right. for the work you put in. But then you're appreciative of it. You, yeah, you're You recognize that it's not for me, it's from Yeah, like you, put it yeah. Right you put it in the right place. You put it in real. That's why it's, we're always talking about live yeah. is, is everything, take everything as a gift. Yeah. Because if you do that, you realize I don't have ownership, right? Mm-hmm. This isn't mine. Therefore, like, in my, I, I'm proud that I was able to accomplish this, but that should lead me to go, man, like, it's because of God that I was able to. Just like the battles of the Old Testament, you know, and, mm-hmm. You know, when they won things, I mean, they always gave tribute to God. You know, if they were of the right mind and a follower right. of the Lord, they gave that to, to to Him, that glory to Him. And, you know, you see where you mentioned Old Testament stuff where people got in trouble. I mean, you see it in Saul where, you know, all of a sudden David kills Goliath and Saul was willing to send him out there to die yeah. and be mauled. And, all right, your funeral. Yeah. And David kills him. And then what happens? People start, you know, all his lore and legend and they start going out. He starts just defeating everybody he fights, and he would ride back in with Saul, and they go, "Oh, there's David, a uh, Saul, and his tens of thou, his, his ten thousand, and David with his tens of thousands." Right. And what happened? Saul's like, "Wait a minute, they're giving him more credit than me. Yeah. I'm the king." And what yeah. happens? He chased he chased David all over the countryside, trying to kill him for years, mm-hmm. you know. And and you see the 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 um, contrast there with with David, who was just a humble servant that that wouldn't kill Saul when he had opportunities, right. all those things, and. And so, yeah, you see it all over the place. And pride is something, as we said, that's the root of all sin. You know, it can make people go mad and make people do things that they would never do because of that. Uh, that pride obviously causes you anger and things like that when things don't go your way and, right. and, and all those things. So let's talk a little bit about what some of the saints say. I mean, we've been talking from the beginning about, you know, what what's Archbishop, Archbishop Fulton Sheen has said in all of these different uh, shows we've done. In the beautiful book that we had, I'm going to put that in the show notes too, is an anthology about the seven words of Christ, or seven last words. He's tying them to these different sins and how they're sort of the answer to these seven deadly sins. Mm-hmm. So uh, this week, he starts off by saying, Pride is an, an inordinate love of one's own excellence, either of body or mind, or the unlawful pleasure we derive from thinking we have no superiors. Pride, being swollen egotism, erects the human soul into a separate center away from God. It exaggerates its own importance and becomes a world in and of itself. 
All other sins are evil deeds, but pride insinuates itself even unto good works to destroy and slay them. And so there's so much there, right? He talks about it's an it's an inordinate love of one's own excellence, whether it's body or mind. It's the pleasure we derive from from thinking we have nobody better than us. Um, it's swollen egotism. And then it pulls us away from God. That's what he says. As you allow your own ego to swell, what happens? You start to go, well, I'm pretty good. I don't need anything. I don't mm-hmm. need to pray. I don't need to go to church. I don't really need God because I'm doing well. And God wasn't here doing all this. I was the one doing right. all this. When's he going to show up? You know, and and that's where we get into trouble and why so many people have fallen in the scriptures to pride in our own world today. He goes on, um, not him, but St. Augustine goes on to mimic this, and he or not mimic, but to echo this. And he says, pride is the beginning of sin. And what is pride but the craving for undue exaltation? And this undue exaltation, when the soul abandons him to whom it ought to cleave as its end, and becomes kind of an end itself. So that's what he says. Is, and this is undue exaltation. When the soul abandons him to who it ought to cleave as its end and becomes a kind of end to itself. Mm-hmm. Right? So you wind up trading God for yourself in this false belief and you wind up losing everything. Right. And that's where so many of us find ourselves if we're not careful. Well, and, and pride be- leads to division, rebellion. Obviously, you know, the biggest rebel there is in in judeo-christian religion is satan yeah. you know he he thought what god had planned was was incorrect and he had a better way of doing it and was upset that he was going to elevate us his yeah. creation above the angels um and and he rebelled yeah and among him he took almost a third of the, the heavens of the angels which is crazy yeah you know? um so that if 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 someone who was of pure being i guess you could say we don't really know this is what we're taught. Sure. Can can do that and have pride pride a concept of pride. Yeah. Then when then we're just as dangerous because we, you know, we're more than capable of having that all the time, that thought. Sure. And that's why it's so it's so important for us to kind of like completely uh, assess what our true thoughts, our true drive and our our decisions are based on, you know. Yeah. It's okay to have like goals and objectives to better yourself, to you know, better your family and to and to get things that you, you, you feel you need, but it has to be of the right mindset. Yeah. Yeah. No, and you're and that's what's so that's what's so tricky and so different about pride is you know, most of the all the other sins, it's really an act. Like you commit an act of greed mm-hmm. or or of envy or of lust or of sloth. With pride, it's sort of it's internal. It's, it's the yeah. one that's right. internal, but it also it also um, what am I trying to say here? It, it destroys other other things, like mm-hmm. even good things. And that's what Saint Augustine says. He goes on to say, our our sins find their vent in the accomplishment of evil deeds. Other sins, he says. Right. Other sins find their vent in the accomplishment of evil deeds, whereas pride lies in wait for good deeds to destroy them. Mm-hmm. And so I love that quote because it's like these other ones, you just kind of, they're just kind of acts out of that sin, right? right? I'm envious, so therefore I'm going to do something and act out of that envy and hurt someone or or lose my temper or whatever, or you know, out of lust or whatever it may be. But with pride, it's like, no, I can go do good things. Like, I'm going to go make a bunch of sandwiches for the homeless, or I'm going to go work the soup kitchen. And then I'm going to go tell everybody right. how I worked at the soup kitchen today and yeah. how many people I served and what I, 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 I. And that's really a, a clue to where we know if we're being prideful is we're telling something mm-hmm. and we hear I, me, you know, mine, all those kind of words again and again. It kind of shows you like, okay, I'm talking about myself a whole lot in yeah, here, yeah. right? God gave me an opportunity to serve and I went and served. But so many times we can we can allow those good deeds to be something different yeah. than that. And you even see it in scripture. I mean, Jesus talks about it in Matthew 6 when um, when he's talking about almsgiving and how to pray and things. Mm-hmm. You know, he says, beware of practicing your piety before men in order to be seen by them. For then you will have no reward from your father who is in heaven. So what does he say? Like, be careful practicing this and trying to be seen, doing things to be seen, or you won't have your reward in heaven. He goes on to say, when you give alms, sound no trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets that they may be praised by men. Truly I say to you, they have their reward. So again, he's saying, all right, if you want to make it all about you down here Mm -hmm. and receive all this adulation and praise and maybe financial reward and all this stuff, then you've had your reward. Mm -hmm. Um, 
That's the crazy thing. He even goes on when he's talking about prayer. He says, when you pray, you must not pray like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners, that they may be seen by men. Truly I say to you, they have their reward. But when you go to pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And in praying, do not heap up empty phrases for they like the Gentiles, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not like be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. Right. He says, pray like this then. And that's when he gives us the Lord's Prayer. But that's in Matthew 6. And what is he saying? Like, don't do these things to be seen. It's not about you. You do these things because I've given you the gifts, I've given you the opportunities, the health, all these things to go and do these wonderful things. But if you let pride in, as St. Augustine says, mm-hmm. it's going to tear those things right in half. It's going to tear them apart. And then what is he What is he going to say when you die and you're looking for your eternal award and you're going, all right, Jesus, right. I did all this stuff. Let me in. Yeah. And he's saying here, like, no, you, you already had your reward. You, cho- you chose to be boastful and prideful and arrogant. And right. to, you sought the praise of others more so to bolster your own pride and your own ego and all those things. So you've already had your reward. For however long, how many years right. you had, you had your reward. But now you don't have one here. It's almost like you, what you were saying came to mind like, you know, the boastful will have a scorecard of all the things they've done because yeah. they're, for them, they, they say, I did this and people saw this. But then for acting out in, in a humble way of heart, you don't keep score. Yeah. It's just you do something, you forget about it. You know, you move on. It's, it's not like you, you, you say, well, uh, gosh, I, I'm, I'm really happy that I gave this this person, you know, this. Yeah. Just for, for me, if things, if I do things, I do things and then I try to forget about it. Because if sure. I dwell on it, then then what I am, I'm, I'm like, like, God, Vic, you're really good. You know, you did a really good job, Vic, you sure. know, that day. And then what ha- what becomes of that? That becomes of like, I hope you see what I did, God. You know, like, you know, I, I deserve that raise or I deserve that, you know, because then you're, you're, you're self-promoting your, you know, yeah. your deeds. And God doesn't want that. He wants to do everything in secret that yeah. way because when he when he sees you doing giving out of your heart, not out of, out of your um, your propensity of of what it could lead to. Yeah, you know that's what he reveres. He he detests this. So yeah. you're right. And and look, we're all prone to it. I mean, we every one of us wants to hear we did a good job. Everybody mm-hmm. wants you know all of us wants if we're not we know like that's why you dream of being the hero and hitting the game winning shot. That's mm-hmm. why you dream of. Of you know being you know when we're kids you dream of all these things that really bring you recognition and mm-hmm. things like that and it's it's part of the original fall it's part of the father wound it's part of all those things because we're looking for that fulfillment and these yeah. other things and if you're not careful it does become about pride it becomes about you know me and that's something that God never wants from anybody and mm-hmm. we'll talk more about about that but I mean you're right it it really did start with the fall of the devil when you mentioned that. Um, and, that, and and it's a great example of what what he talked about about pride leading to other sins. What Saint Augustine was talking about because what happened like Lucifer thought so much of himself. He loved the Lord and he's like, "We're your people." And then God says one day, "Let us make them in our image and likeness." Mm-hmm. And like, whoa, 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 wait a minute, what? And then let us raise them, uh, you know, yeah. up above everything else. And that's when he got angry, as you alluded to, and he got envious. Right, mm-hmm. that pride led to envy. He was jealous, and then all of a sudden, what did he do? He rebelled. And he was thrown from heaven, and his pride cost him everything, right? His pride cost him everything. And you always think that's funny because the Lord, I mean, God created him just like he created us, right? He created angels and everybody else. And so God had a love for him, right? But his pride is what severed that yeah. relationship, and he revolted. And And that's what we do in our own life when we're prideful. We basically go, God, I don't need you, yeah. right? Like, I'm good. I don't need you. Um, you know, everything's going well. That's certainly how I lived in my life for a long time when I was in my drugs and alcohol. I walked away from God. I said, I'm going to choose other things that are going to make me happier than you. Women, drugs, alcohol, my whatever I want when I want, money, power, prestige, you know, job, all that stuff. And I'm going to fill up my own life, and I don't need you. And I put him on the back burner for 11 years of my life. And what happened? I slowly started in a downward spiral that almost wound me, wound up with me losing everything because of my pride. I'll just, I'll be my own God. And that's really what happens to us mm-hmm. and where we run into problems. So we've seen it, like you mentioned in the Old Testament too, not only with Saul, but I mean, you look at David and Goliath. 
So, you know, what happens? Goliath is taunting the armies of Israel for 40, year, 40 days, like 40 days. And then on the 41st day, David shows up to bring his brother's sandwiches, mm-hmm. which he was really going to spy on things for mm-hmm. his dad, you know, to tell him what's happening. And he hears this, this you know, giant mocking the armies of Israel, and he's going, why is nobody doing anything? He goes out there in humility, and what does he say? He's like, I'm not, he didn't go, I'm going to come out there and kill you, and boy, you shouldn't mess with me because I'm bad, and I'm going to, I'm going to get my, my sword and my stones and my slingshot, and I'm going to lay you out. What does he say? You've insulted the armies of, of the Lord mm-hmm. and, the, and, the, and the one true God. And, and he basically says, like, he through me is going to take right, care of this. Right. And that's the approach we have to have. But what is the other side? It's, it's just Goliath is just, just pride, mm-hmm. right? I'm huge. I'm big. I don't need anybody or anything. I'll wipe the floor with all of you. There's nothing you can do about it. I'm yeah. going to boast and be egotistical, and I'm going to mock you. And that's how we become. And it's just a beautiful example of humility and pride. And what wound up winning in the end was the pride of in humility. I mean, was the humility mm-hmm. of this young, brave man who said, "It's not me and what I can or can't do. It's what the Lord has called me to do and what right. He's willing to do through me." And so, it's such a powerful example. But you also see it in the Pharisee and the tax collector, which we've talked about before, where they're praying and the, and the tax collector is saying, "Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner," and realizing how how much he needs God and the lack of 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 importance he is and all mm-hmm. those things. Um, that he needs God. And then you have the, the Pharisee who's like, oh, thank goodness I'm not like this tax collector. And, right. and what happens? Jesus says the, the tax collector went away fulfilled, went mm-hmm. away with the reward basically because mm-hmm. of his willingness to be humble and surrender and realize his own brokenness and right. and not uh, and not to, 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 to so be so haughty and so boastful and so arrogant. So you see that with them too. And then even Peter, you know, we're walking into this week uh, of Holy Week, and we heard it today in the readings for Palm Sunday, when Jesus is like, "Every one of you will run away." Like, and Peter goes, "Not, not me, mm-hmm. not me, not this guy. I'm your boy. I'm your rock, right? Yeah. I'm Kepha. I'm the rock, right? And 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 I'm I'm going to be here, man. Have, okay, Lord, let's not get a little too right. out of control here. I'm not going anywhere. And what does Jesus say? He looks at him. He's like, "You're going to die me three times before the night's over with." And that's what happens. Again, Peter was thinking so much of himself and out of great love for the Lord, I'm right. sure, but so boastful and forgetting it's not about you. It's not about you. It's about him. Right. And so he got into trouble there, and that's where we get into trouble too when we start thinking it's about us instead of God. Right, and you're talking about fervor. Fervor is kind of like a heightened emotion where – the loyalty is there, but then it can go too far. Yeah, to where to where we 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 take over on on doing th- something that we shouldn't be doing. Yeah, um, and 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 we do that all the time. You know, in in the sense of like uh, being thankful to receive something, but then you convince yourself, well, yes, this is this is a gift, yes, but but you know, I think I probably deserve this because I've been putting my hours in. Oh know? yeah, and so it's one of those things where when people go, man, hey. Great job. You know, you talked about this, your story, where you were like, got a reward yeah. for the, the national salesman of the year kind of thing. And and you put a lot of hard work in. Yes. Sure. And the thing is, me, me being in marketing too, I, I know there's so much competition out there that I know that I am not as good as I think I am. But yet I also know that, that God sets up situations for me to, to help people in need, you know, to yeah. be a connective tissue i guess you'd say for for finding someone needing help um and same thing for you you know someone needed something you said this is what we have and you provided that assistance to them yeah and, and sometimes you know we just we're the connection to it all which god probably places there in the beginning but yet we we may recognize it somewhat but then then all of a sudden we, we kind of start taking the rewards on for ourselves and not giving the rewards to god yeah you know? and you see that i mean when we all struggle i mean it, it, it's I see it a lot, like when somebody does something. Like mm-hmm. I was in church one day, and somebody told me, "You know, hey, we're trying to pray in here." And I was having a conversation about what we were about to do in mass, yeah. and it just flew all over me. I was like, "How dare she speak to me like yeah. that?" You mm-hmm. know, I, like no one talks to me like that, and it's so prideful, right? Because yeah. we're just like you can feel it if you think, "Well, I'm, 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 I'm a, uh, you know, impervious to that." No, you're not. None of right. us are. Right. We all struggle with it, and you know, and it, and it, and we struggle with it since the fall. So you have the fall of. Satan, Lucifer, the Morning Star, mm-hmm. you know all the all the other names for him, and then all of a sudden, you know we fall in the garden, and what happens? I mean, that's exactly what it was. And people get well, may say, well, what do you mean pride? Like the devil tricked Eve. 
But what does it say? Like, this looks good to the eye. This looks mm-hmm. good to, to the stomach. It looks good you, for food. You deserve looks, this knowledge. Right, right. right. Why and, would God have this tree in the first place if he didn't want you to have it anyways? Right. And right. so it was present. Like, that pride was present in the fall. Right. And you see the catechism even talks about it. This is one of my favorite lines in the catechism because it really talks about the dangers of, of becoming too inward focused and yeah. believing we're you know too much in ourselves uh in in refusing to continually throw ourselves on the mercy of god that's why we have mm-hmm. confession and those things and adoration to go and be before the lord and remember who's really in charge and who's important mm-hmm. um but the catechism goes on to say in 398 paragraph 398 says in that sin now again the at the fall man preferred himself to god like right there man preferred himself to god and by that very act scorned god He chose himself over and against God, against the requirements of his creaturely status, and therefore against his own good. Constituted in a state of holiness, man was destined to be fully divinized, 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 I don't know how to say that word right, divinized, yeah, by God in glory. So we were made to be in a state of holiness and to be divinized by God in glory. Instead, seduced by the devil, he wanted to be like God, but without God, before God, and not in accordance with God. Mm-hmm. And that's really what pride is all about. It's that last sentence, right? I have, sedu- I have been seduced by the devil, and I'm believing that I can be God without God, mm-hmm. right? And then I can, I can be before God in my own glory without God. Right. And this is the trap that he puts in front of us, right. and that's what he says. What does he say when 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 uh, the devil say to Adam and Eve when she says, "Oh, we're not supposed to eat of that, or we're gonna we'll die." You certainly will not die. Mm-hmm. You'll be like him, and he doesn't want you to be like him, right? He's lying to you. And so, what does she do in her pride? Nobody lies to me, right? And I don't want to put words in Eve's mouth, like because you can get in trouble for right, doing right. that. Yeah. But like the insinuation there is that pride came into it through the catechism and the teaching of the church here that we preferred ourselves to God and basically said. We're going to choose ourselves over you. Right. And we've been doing that ever since. And each of us does it in our lives each and every day. You know, if we're not careful, we struggle with that. And we've got to we've got to to realize this because I mean scriptures talk about it too. I mean, there's one that, and this is exactly what happened at the fall. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. That's Proverbs 16, mm-hmm. 16, 18. And Proverbs talks a lot about pride. Like there's a whole, yeah. you know, in chapter 16 and some other ones, 18, 11, those areas, it continues to say like when pride comes, then comes disgrace. But wisdom is with the humble. That's Proverbs 11, 2. James 4, 6. God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Uh, Philippians 2, 3. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility regard others as better than yourself. And finally, in Galatians 6, 3, says, For if anyone thinks he is something, when he is nothing, he deceives himself. Mm-hmm. And this is the great deception. The devil is the, the accuser of our brothers. He is the father of lies. And he sits there, and the easiest place for him to get into, other than lust, I would say, for men, is pride. It's in your ego. Because if he gets in there and that pride starts to take over, then it's going to flow into every one of those other sins. And before you know it, you're, you're majoring in a lot of them. You know, you're sitting there and you're spending all your time and every other second you're in depth in some deep sin and it all starts with pride. So we have to realize what Paul's saying here is, you know, stop thinking so highly of yourself. Right. Think highly of God because if you do it the other way around, you're deceiving yourself and you're you're basically cruising for a bruising. If you as yeah. my as my dad would say when I was acting out when I was younger, right. cruising for a bruising. Right. Right. So right. Go ahead. Well, that's what you're saying. You're, you know, you're, you're, something's going to happen to you, you know, and it'll yeah. be good. Um, I remember my father, you know, my dad was a Marine. So, yes, uh, the words were <laughs> usually always I needed to incentivize change of behavior. Um, <laughs> um, but, you know, again, you're talking, and I think for all of a lot of us, we, we know a lot of the scripture about people who, who, fell into pridefulness. Yeah. You know, even now in our history books, you know, you know, like Napoleon it was was someone that was above reproach in a sense of ra- rational thought. Yeah. You know, he had a lot of generals saying, we shouldn't do this. We shouldn't do this, you know, and, and he and he caused a lot of a lot of I guess destruction in, in, in France. Yeah. You know, the whole the church was kinda in chaos, you know, he really didn't kinda promote faith. He was all about conquest and 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 you know, getting self rewards and stuff. A, almost a million people died in his campaigns. This is this is soldiers. Not yeah, that's I mean, crazy. so so the thing is because it was all like I have to win this battle, you know, at all mm-hmm. costs. 
you know, sacrificing other people's lives and stuff. And and you know, I know I know I'm going on about stuff, stuff yeah. history, but we need to kind of understand that pride can lead to destruction and death. Yeah. You know, and and it can cause harm to our families, immediate families, because we're not willing to stop and see what we're doing. Then then it can cause like if we're living risk risk a risk life. You know that's bad. You know we can lose our house, we can lose yeah. our family, uh, we can lose our children. You know, and and that is something that we have to kind of ascertain as to kind of like wh- where am I right now? In my thoughts. You know, am I living a life um, coupled with hum- humility? Yeah. Or am I living a life full of ambition, reckless ambition, self devotion, uh, self motivation, and is this the benefit for my family? You know, because we we know a lot of stories. Where mm-hmm. people who who chase the dollar but yet lose their family. Yeah. And and, and I've always wanted to make sure that I was never that person. Sure. I mean, my, my my family is my gift. You know, that's like a, you know, when people say, What is what what was I created to be? Well, for me to be a husband and father. You yeah. know, everything else is secondary. Sure. You know? And if I teach my children, if I love my wife, then therefore, you know, we've talked about this before, that is the greatest gift to give to your children is to see what love true love is all about and how it's shown in the home yeah man all i can say to people out there is i've seen it in my own life like mm-hmm. you know you think you're you're bulletproof and you're you know 40 feet tall and and some people may say john you are 40 feet tall but not literally yeah. you know yeah. <laughs> like but you feel like you're bulletproof you're above reproach you're you're untouchable and usually in those moments that's when god's going okay like now i've got to allow this fall because mm-hmm. You're 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 exalting yourself higher than you should, and it's call co- it's going to cost you everything if I don't bring you to your knees mm-hmm. or allow you to fall on your own to to your knees, yeah. and that's the grace He gave me in my life. I mean, it was in that jail cell when I finally became really vulnerable and admitted I had an issue, and then hit my knees in humility and just said, "Please forgive me. I'm sorry." and and just ask for his forgiveness, which he will give all of us. Right. But that's the key. The key to pride, what's going to offset it, what is the corresponding virtue is humility, right? Is, is humility to realize there is a God and I'm not him, right? Um, it's what we've talked about a million times in the verse and in, in the book I'm writing, Power Made Perfect, that's hopefully going to be out in a year or so. Um, but it's it's about that surrender is, is, is God saying, no, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. And it's not weak to admit that you need God. That's the problem is we get proud and we try to say, I don't need anybody or anything. But what mm-hmm. God is really asking for us is to say, hey, just give me that. Like, let me have those things and surrender. You don't need to be the tough guy. You don't need to be walking tall. You don't need to be Clint Eastwood. You don't need to be any of that fictional stuff that, that the world has told you forever. Right. You need to just under, You need to remember that I'm your father and I love you and I want to take these things on and I want to take them from you. And your job is to simply hit your knees and surrender and admit that you need me. And through that, you can let go of this false notion of control, mm. which is what causes this. So we do that through humility. And the thing is, you know, Archbishop Fulton Sheen again says this about humility. All we have to do is create a vacuum to uh, count ourselves as nothing. And immediately God fills the soul with this power and truth. Mm -hmm. And I'm telling you, that's what happened to me. You know, people go, well, do you have a theology degree? Do you have? No. Well, how do you know all these scripture verses? How do you this? How do you preach this way? How do you? Because God does it. Right, God does it. I ask him every time before I go speak, let them see you and not me. Let them hear you and not me. I say, Jesus, I surrender 33 times. Mm-hmm. I say, Jesus, I trust in you 33 times. And then I go up there scared to death, and I let him do whatever he wants to do through me. And I'm not trying to like talk about myself, but that's what he means, like to create a vacuum. There's nothing here, Lord. I am a piece of clay. Yeah. Mold me into whatever you want. Use me as for whatever you want. And when you do that, man, that's what the Lord is looking for, and that is like – jabbing a needle in the devil's eye when you do that i mean it's the key to everything and that's what he goes on to say he said humility archbishop fulton Sheen, that is humility is truth or the recognition of gifts as gifts faults as faults humility is dependence on god as pride is independence of him this is the remedy this is how we flip the script on the devil and this in this trigger of pride that we all have is to constantly everything in our life is gift right if it rains it's a gift if it's sunny it's a gift if i lose my job it's a gift if i get a promotion it's a gift if my children tell me they love me it's a gift right if my children are are struggling going through something it's a gift because it's a chance for me to help them Mm -hmm. right everything is gift and so we have to look at it that way and this is the way that so many that followed christ um 
the way they did it. I mean, he goes on to say, the humble soul um, always avoids praising his own good works, thus making void the virtue of his deeds. Self-praise devours merit, and those who have done good things to be seen by men will one day hear the saddest words. Thou has already had thy reward. That's mm-hmm. what we talked about in the prayer, in the almgivings. But you even see it in John the Baptist, right? John the Baptist, what does he say when everybody's trying to crown him as the Messiah and all these things? He says, no, 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 no. Not me. There's one that's coming after right. me that will baptize you with fire. I baptize you with water, but there's one that's coming after me. I'm not even worthy to untie his sandals. Mm-hmm. And then when he baptizes him, what does he say? He goes, there goes the Lamb of God, right? He must increase. I must decrease. Go and serve him. It's not about me. I was an instrument to be used. My time to be used is coming to an end. And his time to be known and to be followed and to be worshipped is now here. And that's what each and every one of us have to do in our own life. And and then Victor, I mean, the last and greatest you know, example of humility is Jesus himself, right? I mean, Look at the way he was born. You know, it seems like it's been forever ago since it was Advent. But we were just a few months ago witnessing the birth of the Lord in a feeding trough, in a cave, surrounded by dung and by dirty hay and nastiness. Now, he didn't come in and have a palace, you know, uh, next to a, a giant river in one of these places and, and just live in paradise. Right. He chose a humble uh, entrance into the world. And then his life was humble. What did he do? He worked in a with his hands as a carpenter for his whole life in this hidden life. He didn't hit the ground when he was 18 and go, all right, I'm an adult. Now I'm going to go out and change mm-hmm. the world. He waited until the right time when his father told him to do it. And in the midst of that, he did manual labor and things like that that you would think. I never heard a Greek god right. or anything else, any other god of any other culture coming in or, or, or belief system come in and, and, and say, okay, I'm going to do the, the lowliest things I can do. So he, he lived this humble life. Then he winds up living humbly in the world, right? I have no place to lay my head, mm-hmm. right? He just traveled from place to place, and he was healing and doing all those things. And it struck me the other day when I was thinking about this. I don't ever remember once where Jesus did a miracle for himself. Mm-hmm. Never once. Everything he did was to glorify his Father, right? And you might say, well, he was God too, so it glorifies him. Nonsense. That's not what he was doing. He was doing the will of his Father, and everything he did, he did for others, that we would come into a relationship him with him so we would come to know him and love him. And so it just struck me like he never did a miracle for himself. All that power, everything there, he could have done that, and he didn't. And then what does he do? We're going to see it this week as we walk through him. He goes through the worst hell that anybody has ever had to go through, and he humbly submits himself to the cross, having all the power in the world. It wasn't, as, as Phil, I think Fulton Sheen has said too, um, it wasn't the nails that held him there. It was love, mm-hmm. great love for us. And humbly, he allowed himself to be treated like that and to become, to take on all sin. He who knows, as it says in Scripture, he's, he who knew no sin became sin itself. He did all that for us. And St. Paul goes on in Philippians 2.8 to say he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Jesus had all the power in the universe and everything every one of us would kill for, <laughs> yeah. right? Everything, the, the power of the, what does it say um, in, in Aladdin when the guy gets the, the, the genie? I have all the power of the universe at my fingertips. Mm-hmm. Jesus could have done that and he didn't. What he did was glorify his father and he was became the example of what kind of men every, every, every single one of us need to be. We've got we to gotta take our pride to the woodshed, man, and like wear our knees out praying and asking God to come further in our life and let our knees do the talking because it's not about control, man. It's not about if you think you're in control, then stop breathing. You can't mm. because you don't control anything. It's all up to God. So get out of your own way and just realize you got to let go of that control and you got to surrender in humility. Um, and then we got to see everything as gift, man. You said it. You know, you started this episode or mentioned it in the episode about that. If you look at everything as a gift, Nothing is mine. Nothing is owned. Nothing is is mine to do with as I please. It's all gifts from the Lord to surrender back to him, to ask for his advice on, to steward well. And if we live in that way, then we're not going to have to worry about pride. Mm -hmm. We'll be humble servants of God that are living away from the devil, away from these sins. And that's where the point of Lent is to come back to this. And here we are in this last week, Victor, facing the worst one of all, the the mother of all sin, pride. Mm -hmm. And we need to be able to look at it dead in the face the way Jesus did in the garden, not your will but mine, Father. When he went to that cross, we need to do the same thing and take all of these sins, all these places we struggle, to the cross of our own lives and to to put them there, right? And to put them at at the feet of Christ and let his precious blood cover them and remove them from us 
That's the goal of this week, and that's the goal of our life is constant surrender, constant conversion, and you cannot do that with pride in your life. So, Victor, what are your final thoughts here? I've got a couple of gotcha, I want to share before we close, but I want to hear your final thoughts well, here. Well, like I said before, you know, our purpose is to love God and know God and to to, to serve Him yeah. you know, with, a, with a servant's heart and then to love our families and to love our children if we we're able to have children and, and to, to be a, a church within our home. You know, yeah. to show love, to show mercy, to be example for others, and to do as the much best work we can, uh, and know that it's not us; it's God working through us. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I will tell you what, we need to. The verse that it really comes to mind right now is, "Apart from me, you can do nothing." Mm-hmm. The vine and the branches, right? It's just such a, a beautiful image that the Lord gave us. Of you know, you cut a vine, you cut you cut something loose from the branch that feeds it the nourishment that gives it everything. Mm-hmm. It's going to wither and die. It's never going to produce food again, and that's what happens to us with pride: is we basically self like willingly of our own volition, um, yeah. we we prune ourselves, and we don't prune ourselves; we sever ourselves. Um, and, and move us away from the Lord. So, folks, all of us deal with pride, and we know where it is. Um, we know where it is. That's why it hurts when you think about it and you so quickly shove it into a closet in your mind and shove it away because you don't want to deal with it. But this is the time to deal with it. Um, the Lord is going to the cross. He's carrying all of that weight, and it's time for us to 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 walk beside him and to sacrifice those things on um, on Calvary. Uh, those things that are keeping us from him, give them to him and let him take them with him so we can surrender to him and have the life that we're called to live and be the the disciples we're called to live, going out and bringing others to him. So, folks, the final thoughts here I just want to say is we talked about David and Goliath here, and there's a beautiful quote from Fulton Sheen that I think we can all take into this week uh, as we continue into Holy Week and enter into the Holy Tritium here in a couple of days. Um, The victory of David symbolizes the reality of Good Friday. Pride is Goliath. Our Lord is the humble David who comes to slay pride with the staff of his cross and five little stones, five wounds in his hands, his feet, and side. With no other weapon than these five wounds and the staff of the cross do we gain victories over the Goliath of pride on the battlefield of our soul. Folks, it's through the cross and it's through Jesus that you're able to heal from all of these things. You cannot do it on your own to think that is pride. Archbishop Fulton Sheen is using a beautiful example to compare David and Goliath to what Jesus is. He's the humble David slaying the Goliath and slaying the Goliath in all of our lives if we allow him to. So we go into those wounds this week with Christ and hope for that healing of pride within ourselves. So we're two days away. The last thing I'll say is allow the humility, the passion, the wounds of our Lord to destroy your pride so that you can continue this journey we have started here. Jesus will go give his life for yours and invite you to come out of these seven deadly sins and resurrect with him. And I just would say, Victor, in this week, God bless you to all Mm -hmm. of you as you try to do that in your life as we try to do it in ours. Folks, it's been an incredible uh, joy to journey through this this seven deadly sins uh, series with you and through this Lent. Victor and I always keep you in our prayers. Please keep us in yours. Um, I know these episodes have been a little bit longer, but we're dealing with some very serious stuff here. So thank you for your latitude of grace in, uh, in allowing us to spend a little bit more time with you each week. It's been an honor and a pleasure for me. Victor, I know it has yep. for you. So as we close out uh, this Holy Week, give it all to God, walk to that cross alongside of him, and come out of it a person that's willing to want to change and work on themselves each and every day for the rest of their lives. I know we'll be doing the same. So let's take it to prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Heavenly Father, pride is such a hard thing to overcome and can infect so much of our lives. The devil loves to use our pride as a means to pull us away from you. Forgive us for the times that we are prideful and give us the courage to live in humble surrender. And Father, whenever we recognize our pride raising its ugly head, remind us of the humility of your Son, Jesus, and call us back to the total abandonment to you in our weaknesses. In the name of the Father, Father, and the the Son, and the Holy Holy Spirit, Spirit. amen. amen.